This is going to be a little, uh, a little bit in a different um, regis register. Um, in order to uh, discuss the anti-portrait, we really have to begin with um, some conception uh, of the portrait, which is perhaps not so simple. I mean, the portrait is ubiquitous both historically and currently, but in some senses uh, remains quite academic. Oh, great, it works. <laughs> when I was um, setting this up, I wondered why I put this portrait of uh, uh, portrait by Petrus Christus of a Carthusian from 1441 in at the beginning. Um, what I wanted to have it accompany is a thought that comes from uh, Jean Nancy in his book uh, Le Retrait du Portrait, in which he says the portrait involves two things. It involves resemblance, but it also involves a withdrawal. So it involves a resemblance to an act of mimesis and some kind of withdrawal. That's not to necessarily make assumptions about what is withdrawn. You know, it might be the soul, it might be the character, it might even be life. Rather, the act of, of the withdrawal is uh, absolutely central to what a portrait is. And um, Carthusians were certainly a very uh, withdrawn order. They lived individually alone in their rooms with a little garden where they could raise herbs. Uh, they had a kind of uh, revolving uh, cupboard where food could be placed for them. And they only talked once a week during their long walk, which they uh, took together for exercise uh, in the countryside. So, you know, the idea of, of withdrawal is obviously implicit in their way of life. Um, so the, the, the portrait presents something but also involves some kind of withdrawal. Forgive me for putting up uh, Rembrandt's self-portrait as the Apostle Paul. Having these two Christian references actually shows, I think, to a certain extent, the, the, the central importance of a kind of uh, Christian model, in fact, to uh, the notion of portraiture. I mean, what the Rembrandt shows is the performance of authenticity. So, um, I mean, we tend to think of these as terribly authentic portraits, but they're also um, forms of acting, in a way, uh, self-portrait as the Apostle Paul. So the as structure is essential here and also involves a kind of um, withdrawal from the performance. And it's in this withdrawal, perhaps, that we might want to uh, locate um, some kind of interiority. The interiority becomes um, literal in this portrait of Caspar David Friedrich in his Atelier by Georg Friedrich Kerst, uh, uh, Kersting, where you know, not only, as it were, you know, does the artist involve an interiority, he is in an interior with uh, the window half closed so that he can just uh, see the sky. So there's a kind of doubling in this of interiority. Interiority becomes opaque at a certain point, becomes opaque in uh, Jericho's portraits of monomaniacs, as they're called, or were called then, which he did for a psychiatrist doctor, a friend of his, 1821 to 23. So you have the sense you know, that what the subject is is not necessarily given on the surface, but at the same time that you don't have access to it. Um, and the head becomes, or the portrait becomes a hollowed out head uh, with uh, Francis Bacon, where there's a kind of split between the resemblance to be found in the photograph and the... Um, uh, the sort of uh, material character of the, the face that becomes a head. So in a sense, you know, the Bacon's portraits are the becoming head of face, becoming head as an object and a kind of hollowed out uh, object. So sort of, in a way, an emptying of the portrait in, in, in some sense. 
And one can, of course, also see that empty in uh, the death mask as a certain kind of model of the portrait. This is the death mask of Butch uh, Cassidy, where what is withdrawn from the portrait is, of course, uh, life itself. Um, I was intrigued this week to see in The Guardian this article, Woman Comes Face to Face with Her Dead Brother's Transplanted Face. Um, the face of this woman's brother was transplanted onto a man who had uh, destroyed his face in a gun uh, accident. Um, so it's a very strange uh, photograph of her uh, touching this, this face. So does that man become a kind of living portrait of her brother? That does introduce uh, another question, uh, which is the question of the relation of uh, the portrait to, as I said before, the withdrawal of life and death, and here the idea of uh, life uh, itself. So, in, in, in res respect to this, we could say at least negatively that the anti-portrait is not based on resemblance and does not imply an interiority, which does not, of course, mean that it does not concern the subject or involve the notion of uh, subjectivity. Um, in previous uh, writing on the figure of um, Butadi's daughter, drawing around the shadow of her lover who is about to leave, I've stressed the role of absence in the shadow that is preserved by the outline made by the daughter, but transformed into the presence of a representation by the act of the father, Butades, the potter who covers it in clay and then bakes the clay, making effectively, I would suppose, a portable relief portrait. I think uh, now, in retrospect, I would also want to add um, the relevance of this story to a strictly uh, Roman conception of the image, where the image carries the power of the emanation of its origin, as when the statue of the emperor uh, presides over legal proceedings in far-flung corners of the empire. And, of course, Pliny tells us the Roman paterfamilias would have a wax statue, there would be a wax statue made of him so that when he died or after he died, that wax statue could be brought forth and um, preside over family events so that the ancestors were actually present in these uh, wax statues. Um, another place in which this kind of image appears, uh, in which... Um, to both the element of kind of reproduction is, is added are, are coins. Um, one thinks of perhaps the coin in relation to <coughs> Tardi's relief portrait uh, of the lover, um, where the, 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 the head uh, is the guarantee, in some sense, uh, of the value. Um, this these sort of models would involve the conception of truth based on emanation from the origin that is theorized in Plotinus and comes to underwrite the effectivity of Christian icons, another kind of portrait not unconnected with the avatar. So what is at stake here is precisely the indexical deixis of the shadow and the retroactive production of the icon within a symbolic framework which shifts the portrait precisely from the Roman to the Christian. Based on this, we could say that the portrait is caught in the overlap between, on the one hand, autonomous sovereign being, the emperor, then the subject itself as a quasi-god, and on the other hand, the relic, based on the cast or the imprint or a piece or precipitate uh, of the person. So just some other silhouette. Uh, there's a silhouette machine from the 18th century. Duchamp self-portrait in profile from 1958. Um, a work by John Stezik, or one of a series of, two of a series of works by John Stezik from 79 to 83, Dark Stars, in which the 
uh, cinema actor or actress is actually cut out and removed from the image, so what you're left with is a shadow specifically. Um, and now I'm going to turn to one of my favourite subjects, the guillotine and decapitation in relation to uh, portraiture. Daniel Arras, in his book on the guillotine, writes how the guillotine was described at the time as a machine for producing portraits. This makes the portrait, and this is the important step in a sense, the result of an automatic process, more machinic, um, in fact, than the death mask. Uh, my view is that decapitation is a crucial moment in the history of the portrait, as it is in the history of political sovereignty. And of course, the two are connected. Um, the camera fixing, the, uh, 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 Arras compares the guillotine to the camera with its shutter. Uh, the camera, in a sense, fixes the automatic uh, portrait. The camera enabled the connection of analog processes to the image, at first fixed and then moving. And here, in this picture of the assassin, uh, the, the murderer, Fournier, executed in 1920, you can see very clearly, I think, the relationship between the, you know, the guillotine head and the identity photograph. Both, and the, 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 the idea at the, at the time of the French Revolution of the guillotine was that actually the guillotine head was the only true portrait because the subject could no longer put on an act. So this kind of truth is then carried over, I think, to the um, identity portrait. And here you see both, uh, both kinds. Um, and here you see some... Uh, identity photographs in relation to Bertillon, who developed the, um, measure, the, the use of measurement in forensics and in uh, the standardization of the uh, mugshot. Um, moving on now to um, the relation of the portrait to um, processes of uh, life. Um, and to the, to the in a sense, the registration of an automatism um, in, in, in the subject itself. Um, sorry, just let me get my... Uh, okay. The connection of the... Um, Anti, the, 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 the idea of the anti-portrait, as we'll see, is connected with sheer uh, living and dying to the extent that we could call it uh, a kind of bio-portrait uh, by analogy with bio-power. But this is already present to a certain extent in the portrait. So one of the things I want to emphasize is that we are, we're not really faced with an opposition whereby the portrait turns into the anti-portrait, but that aspects fundamental to what will become known as the anti-portrait are already present in crucial moments of the portrait, really uh, right from the beginning. And this is Franz Xavier Messerschmitt, whose character heads, result in, which he began around 1770, resulted in, uh, from observing himself in a mirror while pinching his lower rib to distract himself from the pain of a disease which is thought to be, have been uh, Crohn's disease. So uh, expressions resulting, as it were, automatically from, uh, uh, you know, from something imposed uh, on, on the body. And this kind of automatism we also see in Galvani's experiment, with a uh, famous experiment with the frog's leg in you know, pulsing, electricity through the leg uh, in order that uh, it move and realizing that nerves depended on uh, electric uh, impulses. Um, 
this idea manifests itself in you know, what we can call the anti-portrait, perhaps, in uh, Brian O'Doherty's famous portrait of Marcel Duchamp from 1966, um, a 16-part portrait based on an electrocardiogram readout of Duchamp's heart. O'Doherty um, is a, was a doctor, and he had access to equipment and invited Duchamp round and connected him to this uh, electrocardiogram and, and produced these diagrams of the impulses of his heart. Um, one of the kind of crucial um, works really in, in the idea of the anti-portrait and obviously connected this has been noted by, I think, Maggie, did you talk, you talked about this already, didn't you, uh, in, in your writing on, on Susie. Um, and there's a second one uh, with mounting increments of the movements of the, the impulses of the uh, electrocardiogram. Um, this kind of approach to uh, bodily traces and aspects of the body as uh, a form of portrait, we also see in Mark Quinn's cloned uh, DNA portrait from 2001. Um, and uh, in terms of bodily traces, one could read uh, Duchamp's Bed of 1955 as a kind of portrait or even a self portrait, <laughs> as one could of uh, Tracy Emin's My Bed of uh, 1998. Uh, To get back to Rauschenberg, um, here I want to distinguish two different, what well, we could see as possibly two different um, kinds of um, anti-portrait. The first side in relation to the electrocardiogram is the anti-portrait of the, if you like, analog traces of the body. But the other, and you know, we see this also in, in the beds as the site of a kind of um, trace of uh, traces of the subject, uh, stains indeed uh, coming from the subject. Um, the other side is a kind of linguistic portrait, uh, or a portrait um, referring to the symbolic um, rather than one might say the real. And Rauschenberg also is important in, in this aspect, in his portrait of Iris Clert of uh, 1961, where instead of sending a work to the gallery, he sent a telegram saying, this is a portrait of Iris Clert, if I say so, Robert Rauschenberg. And this was the work, this is the portrait, because he says it is. Um, another example would be the word portraits of Mel Bochner, and this is his portrait of Eva Hess, uh, which has the word rap in the middle, and, and uh, Bochner, Bochner wanted to make word portraits without these word portraits becoming poems, so they would have to function in some sense in relation to kind of a non-poetic dimension of, of materiality of language. In order to do this, he used the thesaurus to get from one word to another. So it's a portrait constructed using a thesaurus and therefore also includes the idea of, as it were, removing the subjective decision from which word comes after uh, which word, since it's automatically produced uh, by the thesaurus. Um, and uh, taking us back to the issue of you know, death in relation to the anti-portrait, anti um, Adam uh, McEwen, during 2002-2004, made a series of um, works, essentially prints, which were um, imaginary um, obituaries of various figures. This one is Malcolm uh, McLaren, but there were also um, Mar uh, 
Jeff, Nicole, Macaulay, Bill, Rod, Marilyn, and Malcolm. I mean, those are the first names of the series of people who he made the obituaries of. He, he had been, prior to becoming a, an artist, an obituary writer for the Daily Telegraph. <laughs> so he carried over this uh, skill. Continuing this theme of uh, mortality in relation to the anti-portrait, this is Felix Gonzalez Torres's untitled A Portrait of Ross in LA, 1991. So Ross was Gonzalez Torres's lover and died of AIDS. Um, when he was diagnosed, his doctor told him his ideal weight was 155 pounds, so every day the candy is weighed and left at 155 pounds. Visitors are encouraged to take a piece, so it diminishes, um, possibly symbolizing Ross's weight loss due to AIDS, but then every morning it's weighed out again, so it's kind of eternal, but eternally also uh, diminishing. Here's another Gonzalez Torres, Perfect Lovers, 1988. One can read this as a double portrait. Um, and another work of uh, Gonzalez Torres by, I think, 90, of 19, I think it's 1991, um, in which he put this double bed with two impressions out as a kind of poster uh, around the uh, city. And to get back to the decapitated uh, head, um, these are some stills from works by Ed Atkins um, from 2012 uh, to, to, to 2014. The, the, um, this decapitated head appears uh, frequently in Atkins's work, coupled with um, either voiceover or text relating to bodily processes or disease. So you have this highly sort of digitalized, almost avatar-like head and extremely physical uh, descriptions of decay, uh, aging, uh, and in a recent performance, um, blood donation. Okay. Um, so, decapitation. I mean, thinking about decapitation in the portrait, we've tended to focus on the head, um, the head that becomes a kind of vulnerable object. But decapitation has also always concerned the rest of the body. What becomes, for example, of the political body without the head? Does this amount to a redistribution of sovereignty to the people, like the blood spattering the crowd? Or does the body without the head twitch like a decapitated chicken, or like one of Luigi Galvani's frog's legs attached to electrodes in his discovery of animal electricity? The portrait becomes an anti-portrait in this respect when it's concerned with automatism. In Messerschmitt, um, expression becomes automatic, so we could say that these are anti-portraits involving the face, but it is also the case that the body below the neck constitutes the portrait in the automatic registration of its processes, from its life processes to its decay. Um, and I um, include here a series of works by uh, Susan from, and now I can't read the date which I wrote on the thing because it's, it's all kids kind of mirroring. It was 2003, yes, 2003, um, in which, um, in, in which uh, she writes the phrase by hand, before I slip into unconsciousness, I'd like to have another drink. Um, which in part or almost comes from uh, the doors, um, the crystal, ship. Um, she reminded me, do you want me to tell them? <laughs> that uh, the crystal ship is before I slip into unconsciousness, I'd like to have another kiss. And she substituted, or misremembered, and substituted drink for a kiss. So an interesting slip, which we might speculate on um, afterwards. And I'll show you a, a, the series of these, what happens to them. And she's drinking as she's making these. Is it a glass with each? No. One glass of red wine. Red wine. One <laughs> glass of red wine for each. Uh, 
how. So this is after one, <laughs> after two, after three, four, <laughs> five, six, seven, eight, nine, <laughs> ten, <laughs> eleven, is that right, eleven, yes. So this is the, you like, the passing into <coughs> unconsciousness, the, the fading out, if you like, of the subject, and this aspect of the, the fading out of the subject, or the moments of blank, or as Susan Wilson says, intermittence in the subject, is absolutely um, crucial, uh, a crucial aspect of the work. Um, If the blank um, is a kind of absence, the shadow is, as uh, Denis Ollier puts it in an article in October, following Breton on automatic writing, a precipitate. I think we can therefore see Susan's books, the diaries that Maggie talked about earlier, fashioned from Evernote files as a precipitate of her life, what she passed through as much as what passed through her. Not the private expression of the 18th or 19th century woman diarist writing in an enclosed room, an interior expressing itself, as it were, but rather a subjectivity forming itself and being formed in exteriority. The eye fading into the outsides, the shadows. What, one might ask, is the relation between the shadow and the blank? Well, a shadow needs a blank. It will only show itself up on a blank surface. Indeed, it is the shadow that will make the blank show itself as blank. So we need to think, in a sense, about a double fading process of fading and manifestation. The precipitate of the eye, the becoming deictic, occasional of the iconic and symbolic material here encountered, not only actually but virtually, is dependent on and materializes a plain um, a plane for the inscription uh, of the uncatchable. I mean, when a shadow is caught, it's, strictly speaking, no longer a shadow, I mean, if it's fixed. So you could say photographs are all shadow and no shadow at all. Um, so perhaps we could say that if the classic portrait is basically iconic, and of an imaginary me, I mean me in a generic sense. Um, the anti-portrait as it emerges, mainly in the 60s, articulates the symbolic word portraits like those of Bochner, and the real indexical portraits like those of Odoherty's Duchamp, maybe somewhat against pop art's appropriation of the icon, I might think here of Warhol's portraits. Um, Susan's portraits, beginning with the problem of the eye in relation to its intermittence, blanks, shadows, take something more like a fourth position. Not so much a move from the icon to symbol and index, or from the imaginary to the symbolic and real, as in the 60s anti-portraits, but more like a destructive, productive, knotting and unknotting, or weaving and unpicking, the connection of unpicking to Freud's description of mourning should not be missed here. I have in mind the idea that the Lacan in his later work called the Santor 
which he uses to think about language and joys via the topology of knots tied and untied. The term comes from chemistry. It is the set of reactions available to a chemist to synthesize small molecules. So it has to do with a kind of non-intentional production. An unstable synthesis, constantly on the edge of coming undone, which is what we all are, after all, unstable synthesis, constantly on the edge of coming undone. The question arises, a kind of transcendental question, of what is the condition for this productivity that takes place precisely at the level of disruption, disruption of use and the smooth flow of the identity constructing system of which the representational portrait, now above all the selfie, is very much a part. I would say that the shadow by itself is not enough. So to return to the blank of the shadow, what we have here is the indexical, but not as a fundamental ground, something kind of lost in the virtual, so it's not like a sort of virtual analogue opposition. I think that's quite important in relation to Susan's work, particularly the tapestries. It's not saying, oh, you know, we have to move from the, from the virtual or the digital to the analogue. I'm just quickly flick through this because you've seen these before to get to something. Year planners, as you know, Actigraph works. And here, here's what I wanted to uh, get to. Um, on the left is a classic uh, style portrait, but it's actually woven. It's woven in silk. And it's a portrait of Joseph Marie Jacquard, the inventor of the Jacquard looms, which Susan uses to make the tapestries. This portrait is from 1839 and was woven in silk on one of his looms. And uh, Charles Babbage had just such a portrait by Jacquard uh, in his possession. Of course, Babbage was the inventor of the um, arithmetical machine. And then what was the name of the other one? I Hmm? Difference engine. The difference engine. The arithmetical machine added the difference engine which he worked on with Ada Lovelace, who was largely responsible for, for the mathematics behind it, could perform supposedly any mathematical operation, and uh, as already been mentioned, was the predecessor uh, of, the, of the computer. So the, uh, I mean, the Jacquard Lou, we should say, performs a kind of digital operation linked very much, as Susan has demonstrated, with the workings of Photoshop. And it performs a digital operation in Susan's work in relation to, um, to bodily existence, so to the duration of bodily existence, which in a sense is cuts up and digitalizes in uh, a certain way. And so on the other side, I have a detail from a silk tapestry by um, Susan. Um, now, very, very close to um, finishing. So once again, to return to the blank and the shadow, what we have here is the indexical, but not as a fundamental ground, something lost in the virtue, but itself dependent on another level, a kind of nothing, the blank that it make, makes the condition for its appearance. It can, among other things, as uh, Mallarmé tells us, yeah, getting back to another of my obsessions, <laughs> uh, take the form of a book, the pages of which disappear in its reading but might be noticed when the script becomes illegible or material. <coughs> the wreckage of a life floating to the surface, and here I refer to the 
quasi-narrative of one coup d'etat, which is of a shipwreck, and the floating wreckage, including the hat and plume of the master, namely the poet. So it's a poem about the disappearance of the author, as Roland Barthes knew uh, very well. Um, the wreckage of a life floating to the surface, which, of course, in a way, forms perhaps neither a portrait nor an anti-portrait, but another kind of 